Well, welcome back after lunch. Uh, so I'd like to start by, by uh, reminding you again that uh, uh, Dr. Daniel Shaw will be presenting now. Is uh, just out of curiosity, is Sarah Jaffe anywhere in the audience? Doesn't appear to be, but I think she's going to be here, uh, and she will uh, be taking Danny's place tomorrow morning. Uh, Danny participated in the 2015 conference uh, that we had in Santa Fe on the uh, psychology of boys at risk. And so I can say that it's my experience that Dr. Shaw says to the audience that he goes by Danny. So the first thing I want to say is how much I have appreciated Danny's help with this effort. He advised me about whom to invite to the La Jolla meeting, which is described in the booklet, uh, which got us started in this effort, and he has been supportive in many other ways. Uh, so now to get a little bit more formal. Dr. Daniel Shaw is the director of the Center for Parents and Children at the Pitt Parents and Children Laboratory. He also serves as distinguished professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Pittsburgh with joint appointments in the School of Medicine, the Clinical and Translational Science Institute, and Center for Social and Urban Research. Since receiving his PhD in, clinical, in child clinical and developmental psychology from the University of Virginia, his primary interest has been studying the development and prevention of early problem behavior among at-risk children. Professor Shaw has led and participated in many longitudinal studies and prevention efforts, some of which he will now tell us about. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Danny Shaw. Thank you very much. It's a uh, privilege to be here. Everybody can hear me. I'm going I'm to use the rain method and stay and stay uh, with the audience, but not close to that speaker. Right. Um, yeah. So this is sort of a follow-up. If you want to learn more about what we do, our publications are in that top website, and then our clinical activities are at the bottom there. The uh, Center for Parents and Children, Pitt.edu. If you want to learn more, I'm going to take you. This, this talk is going to be a little bit different than the three. Three heard this morning, yes, um, in that uh, although you heard something about context, especially from Ted's talk, more of the emphasis of those talks was the neurodevelopmental side. I work in the uh, domain of poverty and children and very early childhood, so it's going to be a little bit uh, different. And uh, before I start, I'd like to uh, acknowledge some uh, co-authors, one of whom Mel Wilson's in the audience. The person in the upper right is very influential in this, and unfortunately, uh, Tom Deshaun is no longer with us, but he's still quite, as you'll see, more than an inspiration uh, in our work, as, uh, as the other people are. you actually see Ann Gill in a video clip a little bit later. Um, also, uh, funding from uh, our staff over the years. These are literally hundreds of people since 1988, and I'm going to use the acronym WIC. How many people know what WIC is? Women, Infant, Children, Nutritional Supplement Program. If you make no more than 185% over the poverty line, you're eligible if you're pregnant or have a child up to age five. And it served as a great uh, recruiting station for us and now uh, collaboration and partnership with our work and also uh, different branches of NIH, uh, including NICHD, which isn't up there. I'll get in trouble for that. Um, so let me give you a quick overview of how I want to spend these 45 minutes. I'm going to review... Uh, prior research, and it's going to be more narrow than the other talks, a little bit selfish, but I'm going to talk more about two longitudinal studies, one that tracked uh, the precursors of antisocial behavior, including violent behavior from infancy all the way to age 20 and 22, one of the goals of this conference. Um, so that's part one. I'm going to do that in about 10 minutes. 20 years of research in 10 minutes, not easy to do. And then I'm going to provide an overview of an intervention that uh, Tom Deshaun developed and allowed us to help collaborate and adapt for toddlers um, and even younger children now. And, um, you know, uh, I think uh, Ted mentioned Jerry Patterson. Impetus for this was after we had replicated like three times 
uh, our, our association between observed uh, lack of sensitivity in parenting in the first year and later disruptive behavior problems in kids, he comes up to me and says, why don't you do something about it? So that's, thank Jerry Patterson for asking that question uh, many years ago. And then if we have time, I hope we do, discuss recent forays on terms of how we can actually make a difference at the population level, which is not easy to do if you're in intervention right now. How could we, let's say, I don't know, assign 8,000 people in the next two years to an assortment of interventions after screening all of them after birth of their child in the maternity ward? That's, uh, that's what's up on next. So I'll give you. OK. So um, uh, where's uh, Barbara? We just had lunch with Barbara. Uh, a friend, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Akiva Lieberman, asked me to do a review back in the early 2000s of uh, risk factors that you could identify before age three, so that's early childhood for this definition, that would uh, be predictive of antisocial behavior, not violent behavior, but antisocial behavior after age 10. And uh, on this list, you see a lot of uh, normal suspects here. Uh, the one with the largest effect size, by the way, which hasn't been mentioned much at this conference, is, uh, well, Adrian did, excuse me, prenatal exposure to tobacco and alcohol. Largest effect size of anything on that list, which says something about intervention and David Olds's work, by the way, and why he started prenatally. But these others are there, too. Uh, you have uh, neighbor disadvantage, parenting, all kinds of things, maternal depression, lack of inhibitory control. You could put impulsivity up there following uh, Ted's talk, uh, too. Um, a warning. Uh, also, I'm going to show you some uh, cartoons. Uh, this is a little dark humor given the subject matter, but it helps me get through the day, so I hope nobody is offended by them. So when we started, and I say we, my mentor, uh, Richard Bell, uh, back at UVA, started on this idea in the mid to late 80s. Um, we were amazed by, you know, it's interesting what's going on now with shootings, but we were amazed by what was going on with adolescents and with the uh, proclivity and ability to uh, get, um, um, I call them machine guns, automatic weapons at the time, uh, was happening in the mid to late 80s, as some of you might recall that time, and wondering how did this, how did this start? And, and how did we get here? And of course, now we're having a, a different discussion today about that. But we knew, well, what we knew was that treatment, people like Alan Kasdan and others, were having some success, but modest success in treating kids who were antisocial who were over 10 to 12 years of age. Not only was the behavior not as malleable, but parents weren't because they'd been burned by their kids so many times. So we thought, well, maybe if we could capture this process much earlier, just as uh, Ted kind of beautifully foreshadowed for us, maybe if we intervened earlier, we might have a better chance at, of, of stopping this negative cascade uh, of behaviors. Of course, there are two, at least two camps, but back in the 80s, they were pretty polarized. Today, as you heard this morning, uh, people kind of acknowledge nurture and nature. On the nature side, of course, we have genetics, we have impulsivity, we have all kinds of, and of course, um, I've had, in WIC waiting rooms, I had a mom, a uh, seven-month-old baby say, he's bad, and he's destined to be bad. He's got his daddy in him. So there are, there are examples that, uh, you know, of uh, uh, humans where um, there is destiny already set, and you can imagine self-fulfilling prophecies uh, based on that idea. On the other side, we have the uh, parenting as everything camp. And here, uh, Calvin and Hobbes, some of you might recall historical document here. What assurance do I have that your parenting isn't screwing me up? And of course, none whatsoever. But we also have some explaining to do in that camp as to why uh, children who are reared in similar ways, minus some evocative effects, don't turn out all bad or all good. I mean, what's going on there? Perhaps there is. And, and this is what Dick Bell discovered, the child effects model, by having a second child and, how, and realizing how little control he had and influence, uh, and then a third one, too, at that. So um, we've always thought, just as the theme of the conference has, of combining these two into uh, one model. I guess I have to go here to point, yes. And uh, much like uh, Bronfenbrenner, uh, others, including uh, Jay Belsky out here, we've always thought of an ecological model. Uh, because we deal in the context of poverty, a lot of times our least common denominator will be mom. 
uh, here, up here, if you can see that. Uh, we have siblings, we've done a lot of work in there. I'm not gonna talk about that today, but we know they're there, much like nurses in hospitals. They don't get attention, but they have a lot of influence. Dads are important too, not only the relationship, but their direct contact. And I see there's a workshop about that. And of course, where families live. And because a lot of our families are going to be in urban uh, poverty, but also some in rural and even suburban poverty, the greatest growing area of poverty is suburbia uh, today. So we try to combine that perspective in our basic research and our intervention work, uh, too. What do we have going for us? <laughs> what we have going for this is development. So uh, Ted alluded that. He was going to overload you with development. Well, I'm going to overload you with development before age three, which I don't think has been mentioned today uh, very much. Um, so what we took advantage of and what we thought of, uh, we had been, uh, Dr. Bell and I had been very influenced by Jerry Patterson's work and this coercive cycle, which seems to be these acrimonious dyads of, or actually triads of parents and children fighting. But Jerry Patterson knew very well this did not start at age eight. It had to start earlier. Well, when might that be? Uh, is it during the first year when infants are fairly immobile, getting up a lot, parents are there, you know, you could imagine some irritability, but Bev Fago actually found that parental satisfaction went down in the second year. What happens then? I think the terrible twos, thank you, Bonnie. Yes, and uh, contrary to Ted, for a lot of our families, oppositional and aggressive behavior begins before, or at least at the same time, as um, more inattentive and uh, ADHD symptoms. Uh, we have it measured prospectively. So Terry Moffitt and her work, she started at age three. She didn't actually measure what happened, in, but we know parents know uh, what happens in those first uh, two years. And we capitalized on this. This would be the time when a high stress situation, when you know, we're the, one of the few times in the life course where you can actually put a leash on another human being, right? and get away with it. Think about this. When we do this work in Sweden, they are aghast at us using time out because you are you know, putting a child in an area where there's absolutely no stimulation. When they hear about our leashes, which come in uh, different sizes, you have the harness as well as the, uh, the uh, arm of that, they are just aghast at, at what could be. But there's a reason for that. There's an adaptive purpose for most of what we do and you can see it here. So gravity, electricity, crossing the street, harming a pet, none of that occurs to a child, and a parent has to use that word no uh, sometimes or face the consequences of neglect or the child. So we uh, built that in also into our REACH perspective. Theoretically, a lot of you know about attachment theory, I suspect, but maybe some of you haven't thought about how that relates to conduct problems uh, forming in the first two years. Well, I was fortunate enough to have Mary Ainsworth as a teacher at UVA. Didn't get to meet John Bowlby. But we all know that the more sensitive, contingently responsive you are in the first two years, the more your child will be compliant. You are essentially uh, giving a predictable, stable environment to a child who is going to say, I have something to lose here by defying you, right? Whereas non-compliant children quickly learn that the most reliable way to get attention from a parent who, let's say, is not responsive is to be defiant, to make a scene. And if you've ever been in a daycare <laughs> a setting, you know this also happens. The child that gets the most attention is the one that is most oppositional. So we tell our most narcissistic parents that don't be responsive for your child. Do it for yourself, because at age five, you're going to wish you had because that child, when you want him to come to dinner or her to do dishes, whatever it is, uh, it's going to be much easier at that time. I mentioned Jerry Patterson. Couldn't help but uh, uh, put a photo of him in younger years. And he also passed away in the past, say, 18 months now. Uh, but again, our study could be thought of as the origins of the coercive cycle. How did it begin? Jerry uh, thought about this issue. He didn't see kids this young, but he thought it began with a child, and, and very much in Ted's thinking, who might be more irritable or more hyperactive, who elicited this behavior among parents who weren't well equipped. They unwittingly reinforced oppositional behavior by being aggressive itself, and then they take this message uh, to school. Um, so what I'm going to tell you about, I think in four slides, are the 20 years of research where we recruited 310 uh, boys, low-income boys, who are on the WIC program. So they're throughout 
Pittsburgh. I think back then there were 13 sites. It's down to six or seven now. Um, you can see just from the statistics, it's pretty poor over time. The average uh, per capita income was about $2,900 per family member. This is $91, $92, so it's ancient history. Uh, what's most interesting, I think Adrian will get a kick out of this, um, is that uh, in terms of criminality, this was self-reported criminality of the biological father, residential father, or mother at the time when the kids were two years old. And we uh, then prospectively have followed the offspring of these kids through adolescence, that is, and looked at their court records. And their rate, I believe, is 38%. Uh, match that with the 30 six percent, probably underreported, by the way, because those are not official records. But you can see some intergenerational uh, continuity, unfortunately, with those data. This was my life up to about five years ago, where we followed these children and young men uh, from, you can see, we had some of them as young as one, all the way to 23 years of age, including two MRIs at 20 and 22. Uh, Becky Walder and Luke Hyde at Area Guard have used that data quite well. Uh, or we had observations at camp, and most importantly, we had observations of parent-child interaction at one and a half and two. We also had observations of emotion regulation strategies these kids used at two and three and a half. So we could then look longitudinally and prospectively at all kinds of outcomes down the road. Uh, we've had pretty good retention, very proud of that. Over 20 years, we're still at 83% when they were, and this, by the way, got very complicated in the last five years when cell phones get turned off every month as parents aren't uh, paying their bills. So um, one of the ways we look at this is, uh, you know, it's too bad uh, Richard is not here, but Silvana here uh, is a method called growth mixture modeling, where we, instead of looking at how one variable predicts another, we look at similar groups of children over time, right? Whether they are persistently high on antisocial behavior or low, or somewhere in between. And so what you see, you can barely see here, four different trajectories here of antisocial behavior over time. So those of you over here can see this group. This is from ages 10 to 17. We have another paper looking at uh, ages 2 to 8 and 2 to 10. But now we're going to have rely on youth reports, which are um, well, you find out more about than you would use parents or teachers at this age. And these are kids reporting 10 to 17 on the self-report of delinquency scale. This includes violent and nonviolent behavior. So it's not limited, and, and I'll we'll show you what happens when it's violent behavior. And what's interesting here is this one group, uh, I think it's a black line, goes all the way up, and they're out of this world. They're off the chart literally by age 17, which is the last point. We also have another group, and this is my one allusion to James's talk. Uh, this group is very interesting because they start off high, they have all kinds of risk factors in early childhood, but they tend to desist based on their own reports. That high decreasing group is the, the green line, and that group, they said they went down, but six out of 10 of them, or it's more like 12 out of 20, were uh, actually had a petition against them. And then we have a late increasing group, this would be uh, Tammy Moffitt's late starting group, um, uh, not e uh, 49 percent, and then our winners, that, that black line, uh, 78 percent of them um, based on. So the big question then becomes, are there any variables from early childhood that can predict and discriminate these trajectories? Um, which is our next slide, which means I have to press over here. Uh, yes, so accounting in a huge multiple regression, I think there are 10 covariates in this model. Um, we found that, uh, and comparing, I'm going to mess up here, this red group, which is our low stable group, versus our, our high group here, the factors that discriminated the black group from the red group was having a depressed mother between ages one and a half and three and a half. Not parenting, not early oppositional behavior, not early impulsive behavior, but simply maternal reports on the Beck depression inventory when children are young. We also put maternal depression at age 10, age 5, age 15. It didn't matter. It was all about early childhood. What about the, um, the group, uh, that high decreasing group that we thought might have some callous unemotional tendencies? Again, uh, maternal depression and our observations of parenting which included a cleanup task and a teaching task, we, we observed parents who tended to be harsh and literally drag kids around or uh, hit them during our observations, which isn't uh, socially desirable uh, to do. 
So now, here's the slide you want to take away from this, uh, I'll say from my talk today. What actually discriminates violent behavior from early childhood? Okay, we were not going to look at this because we thought, well, maybe we don't have that many kids who actually committed violent behavior. And let me define that. This includes homicide, and this is before age 18, homicide, forcible rape, sexual, physical assault, robbery, arson, and weapons possession before age 18. If we have weapons possession after age 18, we know in our country that can be very legal. This is not if you're a minor, okay? So because of this, uh, we thought that was okay. That was a fairly conservative definition. And we had 52 kids who had met that criteria. Some of those kids also committed nonviolent offenses. So we divided the groups into, into three categories. Uh, no record whatsoever, uh, 162, I think, 52 kids who had nonviolent offenses and the 52 that did. And what you see is if we're looking at, if you're living in poverty, uh, the only thing that discriminated non-offenders non versus nonviolent offenders was income. And I guess that's, I don't know if that's good or bad news, but that's, that's what we found. Uh, but then it gets more interesting. Violent offenders versus non-offenders. So now we have our two extreme groups, those that have been caught, not just committed, but caught. Uh, and, and by the way, it's one out of 80 chance of getting caught for a felony. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's hard to do. Um, uh, so this includes income, oppositional behavior, as um, reported by mothers when the kids were 18 and 24 months old. Oppositional behavior, okay? Um, and then uh, emotion regulation based on an observed cookie task where we're looking at how often kids can actively distract one another versus whining about, I want the cookie now, I want the cookie now, or just sitting in a corner and doing nothing. And then finally, if you're in Pittsburgh and you're black, you're more likely to not only get picked up, but get charged uh, too. And then finally, violent versus nonviolent offenders. So both these kids are getting in trouble, but one is crossing this line that uh, Ted and others have alluded to. And this is where the rejecting parenting comes in, much like Adrian's 25-year-old uh, uh, finding, um, and oppositional behavior and emotion regulation. So let me summarize what this all means, in my opinion. So, in the big picture, including violent and nonviolent behavior, all before age three, observed parenting, maternal depression, which you can think of as environmental or genetic, and other family stressors are the best predictors of this continuing trajectory all the way from two to 17. Beginning at ages two to three, child issues with emotion regulation, and uh, be consistent with Ted's work, this is not this is, I think this would be consistent with a child who is impulsive, by the way, in this task. So it, I think it is consistent with his, his findings, too, there. Um, uh, predictors, uh, excuse me, uh, an oppositional aggressive behavior also were consistent predictors of adolescent and young adult antisocial behavior. Again, broad types, not necessarily violent. When we come to violence, best predicted by income, uh, being black, at least if you're in Pittsburgh, parenting, and child emotion regulation, as well as having this oppositional conduct problem. It's not so, and we measured aggression, too. It was more the oppositional, lack of emotional control um, before age three. Um, now, what do these results suggest? Very consistent with Ted. Why don't we target these behaviors before age three, right, as soon as possible? Because they are fairly stable uh, during that time. So that's the end of part one of the talk. Uh, all right, so the issue is we have this chasm between our basic and applied research. Despite the predictive validity of what I just showed you, and again, a lot of these findings are replicated in other uh, studies around the country and around the world, including Dunedin. In the Dunedin st uh, study, for instance, it was during IQ testing when kids were three or three and a half, and a lack of emotional control predicted in a social personality disorder by age 21. So it's very consistent with that. And Terry Moffitt's work on lack of, uh, of emotional control, how that predicts all kinds, portends all kinds of behaviors all the way through age 40 uh, should be heeded here. And I would add to that, especially in the context of poverty. Now, our rates of referrals in our basic research are pretty poor. So during this very study, whenever moms had scores of nine or more on the Beck Depression imagery, which is not very high, right? We referred them to our in-house clinic where for $2 an hour you could see a clinical psychology graduate student. We referred, I believe, about 149 
uh, parents for that. Anybody want to guess how many came in for $2 an hour to our clinic? Oh, I wish. Three. Three. Three came in. I was directing the clinic at that point and the, t and the head of the family team. So we were waiting, you know, and we also had Catholic charities and Jewish family services. They were charging 60 an hour. I doubt our families uh, came to them either. So this was rather dismaying to me at the time. I had no idea we'd continue following these families, but I kept that, I kept that in mind, and I want you to keep that figure. That's less than 2%. So the question for us was, not so much we don't want to reinvent incredible years or nurse family partnership, but how can we engage these families that we know, or we don't know, we suspect they have a higher likelihood of problem behavior down the road, okay? So how do we bridge this gap between identifying and motivating uh, families with at-risk children? Ah, ah, now you see where we're going with this. It turns out <laughs> mothers and fathers with two-year-olds are in something of a distressed state because they don't know how to manage this. You know, it was hard in that first year. I had to turn my life over to my child, but he or she didn't walk and did not, didn't know what they were doing at that time. So we thought we might have an opportunity here. Uh, we needed an intervention, though, to do uh, something about that time. So, hence the family checkup and uh, a key meeting in uh, Barcelona with uh, Tom Deschamps. Uh, welcome the early step study. We think the, this family checkup intervention is this intervention uh, tailored to answer the call. It provides a means for engaging families at risk. And this is interesting because we're basically recruiting families to get into parent management training or the like. Uh, and how we're going to do it? We're going to capitalize on a developmental period of transition. This might, we think, help fill this chasm between our knowledge of risk factors what goes on in the future, and maybe engaging families at risk in a way that does not feel like big brothers watching you in a collaborative uh, mindset. So it all begins with the famous light bulb choke. How many therapists does it take to change a light bulb? And the traditional answer is one, but you, uh, uh, the light bulb has to want to change, right? That's the uh, psychologist answer. We wanted to change that answer to uh, one, but you need to motivate the light bulb to change. So um, the desire. A lot of our parents grew up, they didn't do well in school. They don't expect to be the best parents. They don't have a, necessarily a positive attitude about their child's future. I was at dinner last night uh, down the road at a uh, Mexican restaurant, and I told uh, the cook there what I did. He said, well, we need you here, uh, Dr. Shaw, because I have a 13 and 15-year-old, and there is no hope. There is no hope for these kids down the road. It's like, oh, great. Now I'm really going to enjoy dinner, you know, that we have. But no, but it was a really serious uh, conversation, he, and he was very authentic about it. He was uh, very concerned. So the desire, accessibility. Uh, I said parents could come down for $2 an hour to join us, but we couldn't guarantee babysitting. They had to transfer on their bus if they lived north of the city. It wasn't easy to do that. And then persistence. We are not going to give up on them, even if our parents say no. We're just going to hang in there and say, when you're ready, we're here. So we're going to be a lot. We want to be in your life, but we also take rejection well, too. Uh, I don't know if people can see this uh, cartoon, but this is a uh, different interpretation of what help means. And the point here is about how therapy and the tact of therapists. So here, Lassie misreads, you know, talk about misreading cues, um, and decides to get help for her herself instead of others. Um, and this brings up the issue of motivational interviewing. How many people know that term? It's probably widely, I'm going to assume most people have it, uh, the work of Miller in nearby Albuquerque, right? It's where we're in the home of motivational interviewing. Um, it has a different tact. Instead of uh, uh, leaning back and just listening and um, using CBT or other method, we're really going to put the onus back on the other, on the, on the family. It's their responsibility. But what we're going to do is give them genuine, transparent feedback on what lies ahead for your family. And then you decide if you want us to help or not. We're still going to be terribly empathic. Um, we are going to give them options, one of which, of course, is doing nothing. And we're going to develop a collaboration with ourselves. And this is kind of the tenets of this. And this is really the brainchild of Tom Deshaun, who saw Miller's work with adult alcoholics and said, I could transfer this and make it work for adolescents who are about to get kicked out of uh, middle school. 
and give parents an option of doing this. Now, in this first uh, run, he got about 28% of families to engage in the family checkup as opposed to being suspended from school. <laughs> it's kind of interesting, only 28% when that was the... Uh, and I talked to Tom about, hey, could you th imagine doing this with toddlers? This is another developmental transition. Parents are struggling. What about it? He said, hey, why not? We did a uh, trial run in Pittsburgh and then a multi-site study, and I'm going to share some of the findings of the multi-site study uh, today. Uh, so here are the tenants very briefly. How am I doing? Go for, okay. Got some time. Um, it's an ecological approach, so it has a lot in common with other parent training models. There is Carolyn, including in incredible years. It comes from the same uh, Jerry Patterson tree and roots. Uh, it's based on an empirically uh, based model of child adolescent problem behavior. We're not going to afraid to use our uh, longitudinal data to inform parents of what lies ahead. Why not be straight with them? It's family-centered. How many people here have seen a family where there's a two-year-old and he or she is in charge of the family? We are going to, much like structural family therapy, we're going to put parents back in charge and uh, kind of uh, make it clear they are running the show. Um, it's assessment-driven. So we give parents immediate feedback, not immediate, a couple weeks later after we digest the material, about what they're doing well, very strength-based, but also what lies ahead and what the risk factors are coming up over time. And we are going to tailor it to social interactions that are developmentally salient. So Tom worked on uh, activating parents of adolescents who are, are engaging with deviant peers, as Ted alluded to. We're working on the parent-child relationship and maybe some action going on at preschool or other areas. Um, we're going to address client motivation to change. From the first phone call, we're going to use concepts like change talk, get parents to consider where they are, what would it take to do something different, why would you think less. We're going to acknowledge the good things with hitting your child. We're not going to shy away from something that might be normative in a family's culture because it's socially not accepted or politically, because we need to find out what's driving them to do that before we can get them to give that up or think about alternatives uh, for that time. Um, uh, Paul mentioned and uh, Ted mentioned diabetes earlier. We think it's about treating diabetes and uh, it's not surgery. So although we could do some help by getting in families and never seeing them again, we think of it much like the well child checkup pediatricians use where you have an annual checkup. Some years you're doing well, some years not. You need some follow-up treatment. So we don't consider it surgery. We consider it health maintenance. So ideally, you would be seen just like in diabetes or dentistry uh, once a year or thereabouts. So um, this study, this research, and this was an uh, RCT, a, re a randomized clinical trial. Uh, we went back to WIC offices where I'd done my basic research, but this time uh, Mel led a group in, uh, outside of Charlottesville, more of a rural area, and Tom had the suburban neighborhoods of Eugene, Oregon uh, at hand. Uh, we had an initial assessment that lasted two and a two and a half hours control and intervention group because normally the family checkup starts with a get to know you visit where we find out more about what's going on but because we didn't want the control families to get contact or, or miss contact with someone the interventionist had everyone got the assessment first um, and then we had this initial get to know you visit with just intervention families where we find out what's important to you what is parenting about? What aspirations do you have your child? And of course, rapport, uh, empathy, all those things are going on there. And then we digest the data. Remember that statistic, three out of 148, 149? We got a little better result this time. In our pilot study, 92% of families allowed us to have a home visit with them. 90, that, this may, I had a big smile on my face for about a year because of this. And then in our multi-site study, which is 730 families at three sites, we got some dilution, but still 73% allowed us to have, on the average, three visits in their home with us using the family checkup. And most importantly, we were allowed to do this every year for four years initially, and over 90% had at least one family checkup over time. So our ability to engage uh, seemed to be improved over our traditional uh, methods. At the very end of hearing everything about you know about this, this child and this family, uh, we asked parents, if you were going to change some things in the next year, what might those be? And they talk about goals. They put these goals up on their refrigerator sometimes, and, and we go from there. 
uh, in terms of average number of sessions in this initial trial. In the pilot study, when we were learning how to do the family checkup with Tom uh, via video conferencing each week, we still got an average of three sessions. Two of those were the get to know you and feedback. So on average, just one other session. When we learned what we were doing and, and we incorporated Charlottesville as well, we got up to four. So this is not long treatment, but it is annual over time. So this is how it starts typically in the field, initial interview, home assessment, and then feedback. What's important here, too, is that, I, I know I'm going to sound like an advertisement, but the family checkup can then go into using incredible years. It could go into our own everyday parenting model, which looks a lot like the incredible years done on a uh, home visiting uh, situation, or Marion Forgatch's uh, PMTO model over time. It could also go, if parent wants it, medication for their depression. It could be referring to a group, if there is, uh, for addictive behaviors, whatever it is parents want. So parents have a sense of ownership in this because it's up to them to decide what and if. Interestingly, we do not see dose response effects in this research. That is, having follow-up sessions does not seem to be important as having annual feedbacks. And the number of feedbacks per over a time period is a stronger predictor than whether I had three follow-up sessions after the end of the feedback session. There are questions about that. I can answer that later. I want to show one video clip of, uh, it doesn't capture the intervention, but it does capture a sense of some of our moms, where they were at the beginning of this. And this is Ann Gill, our super interventionist. For most part, we do what we grew up with. And you want to make changes, but you don't have you know, other ways to learn about other things to do. It's hard to do. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Especially when, I mean, I've, I've even tried, well, not tried, but like when we go to the mall or we, we're on the bus, it's like we're, we're, you're stuck because he's acting up, but there's really nothing. You don't know who's on the bus. You don't know who's going to think what you're doing is wrong. Oh. And nowadays you can I mean, I understand you have to have some protection against kids because I know there are people out there that abuse their kids. But on the other hand, I mean, what am I supposed to do? If he's jumping around in the seat and I want him to sit down, I mean, even if I want him to be quiet, there's people that want to that think, well, why does he have to be quiet? Because I want him to be quiet. It doesn't matter why I want him to do it. I want him to be quiet, and I have no way of making him be quiet. So, so. Not like what I'm hearing from you say, Jamie, is like you want to learn how to have Joshua understand that you're in charge of him. You're in charge. Right. You're the boss. You're the parent. You're in control. Right. Without being... Abusive. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to abuse him, but on the same sense, he's not going to abuse me. <laughs> so, I want to be a good mom. And I don't want Joshua to have I want to be a good mom. She left there, but she couldn't get there until she had also expressed the other side of that, which is what she goes through when she's on the bus. And through Anne's skillful uh, questioning using MI, she, she was able to get there. It really frees her up uh, to do that. Um, so this is what parents see. I know those of you in the back, this, you need 2010 vision uh, to see this. But these are a list of categories. And those stars you see on them are what we present to parents. We first give parents a blank stare, because this is like a report card on how how your family's doing. And some families get very nervous, especially if they've seen this before, as to what they do. But this is kind of the motivating force. This is what sometimes they put on their refrigerators. And you notice, in this case, there's a lot of green here. There's a lot of things in green. So in this case, I can barely read them. I'm going to duck under. Um, in the top, it says child temperament, child behavior problems. This is a uh, two-year-old, and they're above the 98th percentile. What we might say to parents is, if we had 100 kids in the room right here, your child would be one of the two most disruptive because they scored at the 98th percentile. We're very truthful with them. And we let that sit with them. And we also tell them this is a fairly stable characteristic, at least in their, their mind over time. This creates some tension, uh, some dissonance in the parents of wanting to do better over time. We also, this mom also was very high on uh, emotional well-being in the second column. She's uh, in the clinical range on the CSD in this case. Um, and we tell you, and we don't say, you know, you're depressed, you should see someone. We say, based on our data, we say, you know, uh, parents who report symptoms like you, what we say to them is, 
<laughs> what we say to them is that, um, do you know what these symptoms might have an effect on your child's future? So instead of saying, you need therapy, we say, you know this might affect, because we were playing those attachment strings there for parents to try to give them self permission to, to do something about it. Okay, clearly I have to stop very soon. Um, let me just show you um, uh, some data in terms of what happens. We have now followed these kids all the way to age 14, uh, by the way. The intervention lasted much like Fast Track, lasted all the way through age 10 with a break of funding at age six, but we went from two to five. And, and again, families tended to have fewer of these um, feedbacks every year, but still in the 60, 65% range over time. And these, I'll just show you, these are the, some of the findings that we've had in early childhood. And they surpassed our wildest dreams in terms of not only affecting child problem behavior, but collateral effects on language, BMI, mediated through parenting, um, a lower parental neglect observed by our blinded staff, improvements in marital quality, parent-child relationship, again, all mediated by improvements in parenting and or maternal depression when kids were two to three. Ding dong, does that remind you of a finding we had in our basic research that suggested these were the predictors of violent behavior at age 20, right? Kind of pulling it all together. Um, improvements, going to the, uh, another focus, were not found to be different by boys and girls. In this study, I'll say one more thing about sex differences here. We recruited boys and girls evenly for this study, for the intervention study. We actually met our quota for girls faster than boys, uh, age two or three, in terms of disruptive behavior. But very much like Caroline was saying, we see slightly different uh, levels of that, and it desists at a much faster pace for the girls from two to five. The differences we see in sex differences are on child factors, much like Adrian and uh, Ted have alluded to, inhibitory control, uh, boys, and, so already at two and three. So the correlations, though, between girls who have high rates of, let's say, aggression or uh, rejecting parenting and later problem behavior are not different. It's just that there are more boys with higher levels of these risk factors over time. I'm going to leave you, I'm going to skip uh, one more slide here. This is now findings in middle childhood uh, going to less oppositional behavior all the way to age nine, uh, better academic achievement, less internalizing problems. Uh, Aaron Connell just analyzed suicidal ideation for our boys and girls, and we have an effect at 10 and 14 on that. And we just looked at some, um, we have DNA on these uh, 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 boys and girls too, and we see that the, the kids that were most helped were ones who also had uh, a polygenic risk score, uh, uh, susceptibility score, I should say. So that is, those that did the worst were in the control group with this susceptibility score, and those who did the best were in the intervention group with the exact same genetic profile uh, over time. And this is coming out in development psychopathology in the next uh, few months. Okay, I'm just gonna show you one last slide, and then I'm out of here. I'm gonna skip all this. And just, I have to share this one study because as uh, depressed as I might have uh, made you over time, we've just been given a uh, chance, I think of my uh, professional lifetime, and that is uh, Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh with local foundations have decided to launch uh, a study for which a cohort of 5,000 births, there are about 10,000 a year in Pittsburgh, uh, we've given permission to recruit families and fund this many interventionists based on our predictive data. So they're going to come in, mothers and fathers are going to be included, and the day after birth, before they leave McGee Women's Hospital, are going to take a 30-minute screen. And based on that screen, we're going to offer parents different options. Uh, video interaction projects, some of you might have heard of that as a uh, procedure that's done while parents are already in the uh, pediatric center. So we have different interventions based on whether uh, the risk status of the families. Families, of course, can say no to this, but we're hoping we might be able to change some cascading pathways as a result. We have another cohort of only 3,000 toddlers and the preschoolers that we're also in charge of, and we're going to be able to offer them those same options over time. If you have questions about that, I can answer that study. But that is starting in three months, so I'm kind of going crazy right now, trying to organize interventions for about 8,000 families. Thank you very much. Oh, whatever. I don't want to go, but uh, yeah.
Uh, any questions? Yes, please. Hi, um, I'm Melissa. I'm from Connecticut, and I work in a program called Child First. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I don't know. Um, it's an in-home model that works with families similar to what you've recruited for. Your I'm, I'm curious about um, one of the one of the, the the better outcomes of our model is that um, we see a, a, a large decrease of symptomology around PTSD for the parents. And Very so nice. we look at that as kind of like, okay, even if our behavior changes aren't huge for three-year-olds, if parents are experiencing less trauma symptomology, then they're having better emotional and responsiveness for better the children. Better interactions with Be the kids. Better interactions, yeah. So yeah. It's, it's a ro we feel it's a very robust finding. Yes. But one of the issues, but we integrate uh, adult trauma work into the model as an in-home model. We do that. So, but one of the challenges for some of the other in-home models that don't have that kind of service is finding appropriate treatment for the adults who are, in our families, it's, it's incredibly high. It's like 97% of the adults are uh, screening positive on the TESI. Yes. And so just finding appropriate treatment for adults who've experienced high levels of trauma who are parenting young children and what is happening in your area that we could look at or anybody's area that we could look at to sort of build a cohort of people who are more so. trauma-informed, but in trauma-informed in the context of working with parents that have caregivers have young children. Great, great points, uh, many of them. I wish I had answers. Uh, we, get, we get pushback now on asking about trauma, for instance. So we did uh, a few focus groups, because we're, we're worried about this, we call it the Pittsburgh study. How arrogant is that, right? The, uh, the, this new study, right? And we're very concerned, talking to a lot of parents who have trauma, and I must say it's about 90, over 90% of the parents we asked have experienced a non-accidental trauma before age 12 in our sample. I mean, that's just astonished. I mean, I, I can't get over that. So the question is, what do you do with that? Do you screen for it? Well, it's so normative. It would be like screening for someone. Do you drive? You know, do you eat during the day? I mean, it is so darn normative. And our parents say, yeah, we don't want to rehash that. We don't want to go into that. So we're trying to meet them where they are, and we're almost going to assume they have it. And it's going to come up whenever in the course of our intervention, whenever we get into, you know, whenever we get this resistance back. That's our thinking. But, you know, we're kind of, we want to, like our first goal, we had a trauma questionnaire, and then we got pushed back at the screen, that 5,000, and we said, no, you're going to lose everyone that way. Or you're going to lose 1,000 families, not everyone. Um, so it's really tough. Not dealing with it is also out of the question, right? So um, we can talk later about ideas. That, it's there, though. It's like an elephant in the room, right? Because it's one of our bigger areas of resistance, the trauma comes up and gets in the way of them doing. So we're stuck with that. Yeah. Uh, my name's Rebecca Riley. I'm um, a director here of a tribal home visiting program here in New Mexico. And I thank you for the information because some of, or most of what you are saying really resonated with some of the things that we're trying to do with families as well. So, um, but I wanted to go back to one thing that. Uh, you mentioned was um, in regards to trying to engage families that are high risk and yes. trying to um, uh, motivate them into something that they might not be motivated at the time to do yes. um, in addressing accessibility because in the state of New Mexico we have very limited resources. Um, we're serving families in rural areas that may not have access to those things but once the opportunity does come up to identify the family and then to maybe even identify a resource for them, um, how do you address, uh, because I feel like if we can't address the basic needs of families, how can they focus on anything else if they're worried about, you know, where yes. gas money is going to come from, where grocery money is going to come from. Electricity, right. housing. Right. Yes. So how did, stations, yeah. Right. Yeah, so how did needs. your team address that issue and um, what are some things that you can maybe suggest to us as well that are trying to yes. deal with that challenge and um, other things that you know might be worth looking into as far as um, can I can I pause yeah. and just try to answer yeah. that so um, you know huge issue it's like a Maslow's hierarchy of needs if you don't you can't eat sleep how can you worry about parenting and and those things are going to affect your parenting too so we try to provide that if we don't personally make the call for section 8 housing or try to get uh, funds for them we sure get on the phone and find out for them we'll go to have IEP conferences with parents or at least role play with them if they don't want us to be there so it's very much on the ground with them we're not like um, 
MMFT, uh, multi-systemic family therapy, but we'll get our hands dirty quite a bit and, and take on the role of social worker if we need to. If we, whatever it needs to do to get the parent with us, we'll try to make that happen. Yeah, and I guess yeah. that speaks to my next question is, and, you know, oh, how do you way, equip the staff? Uh, just to, to add to that, Beth yeah. Stormcheck has developed an online version of the family checkup. So for families that are 200 miles away, they actually do this whole feedback thing on video. And I know PCIT, to be fair, also now has, they send the earpiece in the mail and again through, so the internet is, is changing how we deliver to families that are more rural and less reachable. Right, right and how, you, how do you equip the, um, what, you know, quote unquote paraprofessionals, if they're not social workers, to be equipped to handle those situations. So right, that, you need training, you need to train them. Yeah, because those are real and those are gonna happen with what? Three out of four families you see? Something like that, yeah. Thank you. Sure, thank you. I'm Nurit Path, I'm a psychiatrist here in New Mexico. Yes. Uh, my question is, you say that many of the parents have had trauma, more than 90%. That's what they you, tell us. Yeah, do yes. you see less trauma in the kids that are in your cohort? Do they, because of your intervention, is there less trauma for them? We know we have, based on our observational data, we have fewer reports of child neglect. So that's encouraging. Uh, some of our families still have contact with Child Protective Services, some of our intervention families. And so we're not, it's not a panacea here, uh, but we, we think we are making headway for some of the families. I think the other point of this, I've tried to make this, of course, an advertisement for the family checkup, but one of the other take-home messages from this, it works for some families. So a slide I didn't show you, which, which is informed by our screen, was that within our WIC sample, we got about two out of five families showed effect sizes of 0.6 to 0.8. The other 60% effect sizes were 0.0 to 0.1. They were, we wasted their time. And those families were those with low levels of risk. So they were poor, they could have been single parent, but they didn't have a depressed parent, prior contact with child, youth, and family services, a history of mental health disorders and treatment, or maternal depression. So we are now doing a screen for not just will your child be at risk for antisocial behavior, but will you respond to our intervention base? Because we, you know, we didn't know this. We did this whole trial in Melbourne, Australia without knowing that, and we, we took in a lot of middle class families we shouldn't have, frankly. Uh, we didn't know it at the time. Yeah, just to throw myself under the bus a little bit. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.